Good day, everybody. I am Comrade Isaac Enigbawa from Microbiology Department, taking on the course MCB 214, which has to do with the principles of sterilization, disinfection, and chemotherapy. I am taking the course with Dr. Ibrahim Taibat. The course outline is segmented into eight topics, which covers one, a review of methods used for sterilization and disinfection, definition of terms as number two, number three, criteria and viability for sterilization and disinfection, four, Exponential kinetics, five, physical and chemical agents, six, inactivation of viruses, seven, classification, disruption and action of chemotherapeutic agents, and eight, drugs resistance and susceptibility testing. Dr. Taibat will take topics one through four why are we take topics five through eight um, topic five which is what we are considering today has to do with physical and chemical agents physical agents are chemical agents physical and chemical agents are used in the control of microorganisms the control refers to the reduction in numbers and or activity of the total microbial flora on our skin, surfaces, food, or anywhere in our environment. In other words, the use of these physical and chemical agents is aimed at reducing the number or any activity of such uh, microbial flora deposited on our skin or on surfaces in our food or anywhere in our environment since the microbes are ubiquitous. The control of microbes is essential in order to prevent the transmission of diseases, stop decomposition, stroke, spoilage, and prevent unwanted microbial contamination. In other words, the essence of controlling these microorganisms is to prevent their ability to transmit diseases to uh, humans or any other living uh, organism around or stop the composition or spoilage of our food uh, materials or prevent unwanted microbial contamination. The physical agents include such methods of control as heat, cold temperatures, desiccation, osmotic pressure, radiation, and filtration. Control of chemical agents refers to the use of disinfectants, antiseptics, antibiotics, and chemotherapeutic antimicrobial agents. Since we'll be talking about some of these terms as the discussion continues, uh, it is important that uh, we get used to or have a knowledge of what some of these terms will be using are. And a few of them are spread out here. Number one, death. Death could be said to be an irreversible loss of the ability of a living uh, organism to reproduce. On a general note, viable organisms, including bacteria spores, once in a favorable uh, environment, are capable of multiplying, but dead ones are not. If we remember from the characteristics of uh, living things in our elementary biology, you know that living organisms reproduce. 
So death is the opposite or terminal end of a living life. Once the ability to reproduce is irreversibly lost, then death has occurred. Number two, sterilization. Sterilization is a process that allows all viable microbes. When I say microbes or microbism is the same thing, including viruses and endospores, decontamination. It's another word we'll be encountering. And this has to do with the treatment of an object on inanimate surface to make it safe to handle. That is to reduce the hazards associated with such uh, material. You are decontaminating it. Another term we'll be considering is disinfection. This has to do with a process aimed at destroying vegetative pathogens, not necessarily endospores, or inanimate objects. In other words, it's a process of removal of vegetative pathogens, not necessarily endospores, on non-living surfaces. Disinfectant is any substance that one uses to achieve the purpose of disinfection earlier mentioned. Antiseptic. Antiseptic is an agent that keys or inhibit growth of microbes but is safe for use on human tissue. In other words, it, can, it is applicable on animate objects. 7. Antibiotic. An antibiotic is a metabolic product produced by one microorganism that inhibits or keys other microorganism other than the one causing its uh, production. Germicida is another term we'll be considering, which has to do with any substance or process that keys germs, and the germs generally means bacteria, viruses, and any other microorganism that can cause infection and disease. Another term is cider. Cider is an agent whose action keys microorganisms. So if you are using microorganisms, it would be microbiocida. If it is only for bacteria, it's bacteriocida. So another term is static. An agent whose action inhibits the growth of microorganisms is said to be static. If it is microorganism generally, it is microbiostatic. If it is bacteria that is narrowed down to, it is bacteriostatic. This one doesn't uh, kill, but rather inhibits the growth, that is suspending the growth of those organisms so that further developments are on hold. Factors that influence the action of antimicrobial agents. The number of microorganisms is one of the points that influence or affect the action of these antimicrobial agents. The higher the cell count, the longer it will take to destroy the microbial population. The nature of the microbial population also affects the activity, whether or not there are resistant forms present in the sample to be disinfected. In other words, resistant forms don't necessarily take up the chemical or it rather it prevent the uh, effect of the chemical on it such that even in the presence of the chemical, it still persists. And there are certain uh, stages or developmental stages that the organism will adopt in order to uh, prevent the effect of those uh, uh, chemicals or other harsh conditions like formation of spores. So if in a material you want to disinfect, there are spores, it will now affect 
the action of those uh, antimicrobial agents you want to use on such uh, contaminating material. The temperature and pH of the environment. Some higher temperatures affect uh, the activity of certain uh, enzymes, while some can only happen when the temperature is uh, increased. So, so is the pH. Some we act in an alkaline pH, some accept in an acidic pH, while to some it is better at neutral pH. So depending on the condition of the environment, the effect on the action will be telling depending on the condition of the environment. The concentration of the antimicrobial agent the there are all known and standard concentration of any antimicrobial agent to affect the ability to uh, inhibit growth or ability to kill now to some depending on the type of uh, microorganism present it needs the concentration to be increased and uh, whether or not the normal known concentration is able to take effect or whether you will have to increase it depending on the contaminating microorganism. That is why, for instance, you go to a hospital, a normal regimen for a drug, antibiotic to be precise, may be one that you are supposed to take for five days. Because of what the clinician is thinking, we ask you to maybe extend it for, say, seven days or take it even up to ten days in order to increase the concentration of the antimicrobial agent. Another point that also affects the or have influence on the action of the antimicrobial agent is the mode of action. This has to do with how something works on a bacterium. For instance, does it act on the nucleic acids or the cell membrane or on the cell wall? Each of the agents, chemical agents, or even if it's a any of the physical agents, the ability to act has a target. Each of these methods has a target that it affects the causative uh, or the contaminating organism. Whether it is attacking the nucleic acid of the causative agent or it is the same membrane of the causative agent that the agent, chemical or physical, is going to attack or is the cell wall. So this influences their action. Last of the points of influence on the action of the antimicrobial agents is the presence of solvents, interfering organic matter, or any other inhibitor that will prevent the uh, microbial agent, antimicrobial agent from reaching its source of activity. As I said earlier, where it is going to attack is a different thing and then the ability to reach there is another thing entirely. It will be well that the antimicrobial uh, agent is potent, is effective and that the site is also there but if a root it is unable to reach there maybe as a result of inhibitors or any organic matter like say pus for instance in a wound or things like that you will expect that uh, the effect of the antimicrobial agent will be impaired. For instance, if you get to a hospital with a wound that is not uh, taken care of, that there are enough dead cells, you will see them trying to remove the dead cells away, remove the pus that is there and clean the wound to have a fresh skin before they will apply anything to prevent further decay of the skin and whatever. What they are trying to do is just to remove the interfering uh, organic matter so that the effect of the antimicrobial agent will be fed. Assuming it is a wound where we are trying to remove uh, the organism from, the causative organism from. Now, 
the targets, as we were trying to talk of the influence, we've spoken about target from there, whether or not it is going to attack the nucleic acid, that is the target for the drug, that is the target for the antimicrobial agent, and so whether or not it will target there, it will reach the target, the these cellular targets of the physical and chemical agents has to do with one, the cell wall. Cell walls become fragile and then the cell lysis. If the antimicrobial agent applying, applied is the one that is supposed to attack the cell wall. When the attack is there and the effect is fed, the cell wall will become fragile and the cell lysis and uh, eventually the organism dies. It can be also said to, in this manner to be the mode of action of such antimicrobial agents. Examples of agents that target cell walls include some antibiotic or generally antimicrobial drugs, some detergents and even alcohol. Another point that is a cellular target is the cell membrane. The microorganism antimicrobial agent will attack the cell membrane of the organism, causing it to lose integrity. Uh, you know that uh, under normal conditions, each organism has uh, a cell membrane through which uh, preferentially materials pass in and out of the cell as the metabolism occurs. So if any attack on the cell membrane that will affect the integrity, the normal natural movement of materials in and out of the cell will be affected. And such agents that does this uh, attack on the cell membrane uh, as agents like the detergents and the surfactants. Another uh, Cellular target of physical and chemical agents is the cellular synthetic processes of the DNA and the RNA, where your uh, agents or characteristics for transmission or for transfer onto offsprings are embedded. Now, agents like antimicrobial drugs like radiation as a physical process, like formaldehyde and nuclear oxide as a gas targets nucleic acids and prevents replication and transcription, which are protein synthesis processes. Now we consider the physical agents before we go on to look at the chemical agents used in the control of microorganisms. The physical agents include methods of control such as heat, cold temperatures, desiccation, osmotic pressure, radiation, and filtration. We'll be considering them one after the other. So number one is heat. Heat could be applied as either moist heat or dry heat. Under moist heat, this uses lower temperatures and shorter exposure times. The temperature is not so high and the exposure time is short. The principle of, uh, I mean, the mode of action is that it coagulates and denature proteins. And you know, in a living cell, you know what proteins are for. Formation of structural uh, materials needed for the growth of the living organism. And so once the proteins are denatured or coagulated, growth ceases or is temporarily suspended. And that affects eventually the replication of the cell in question. The heat can be used at, the most heat can be used at a below 100 degrees Celsius. A, one of the common processes used here is pasteurization where uh, the milk we take is uh, exposed to temperatures below 100 degrees Celsius so as to eliminate the contaminating uh, 
microorganisms. S, what you'll be taking as milk will be poison because the microorganisms could turn pathogenic on entry into your system and cause severe damage health-wise. The most heat can also be applied at 100 degrees Celsius. This one, for example, in a process we call uh, tindalization. Tindalization has to do with uh, process of disinfection uh, where the material to be processed is exposed to heat on three consecutive or subsequent days in order to eliminate the contaminating microorganisms. The principle is such that the first exposure we eliminate any uh, vegetative form of the contaminating organism while the material is now incubated. On remover on the second day it is allowed and you will see that uh, any other spore that would have been there will not be allowed to germinate. When on this incubation on the germinate, it will not be sent back into the steamer and all those germinated spores will also be eliminated as the heat is applied. And then the last incubation we allow any other material or contaminating microbes that would have been there to still grow and it will eventually be eliminated. So that is the principle of the heat, moist heat application at 100 degrees Celsius. The moist heat can also be applied at above 100 uh, degrees Celsius in what we call steam under pressure, a process generally we call autoclaving. You know, on a general note, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at normal atmospheric uh, temperature and pressure. But when the steam is allowed to operate under a compressed pressure, you will see that the penetrating power is increased and water will be caused to uh, boil at above 100 degrees Celsius. Now in an instrument called an autoclave, where all the uh, air which would have impaired, uh, we've spoken about inhibitors in the other uh, first stages, we're trying to talk about things that will influence the effect of this uh, and sorry, this uh, antimicrobial agents, would that is this heat, as we are trying to talk about, you will understand that uh, the steam will be given to attack these ones. And the moment the temperature, the, the steam is allowed to act under a compressed pressure. It will penetrate and as i was trying to talk about the air if present will prevent the penetration so it will be as an inhibitor to reach the target of this physical agent the steam in this case and so the air has to be removed and then the pressure once all air is removed this uh, autoclave will be closed and then the steam will start building and when it reaches the required pressure, for instance, if it is culture media, maybe 15 uh, PSI, which is pounds per square inch, which is equivalent to 121 degrees Celsius, the timing will now start. And then for 15 minutes, for instance, all uh, microorganisms present, including spores, will be killed. In this case, not just uh, inhibited, killed. At this level so it's one of the best ways of uh, physical uh, application of heat under most uh, condition now the dry heat which is another form of heat application we've just spoken about uh, moist heat the dry heat 
is the second one or second part of heat application but in this case it is not moist but dry and it uses moderate to high temperatures unlike moist heat that uses low temperatures with shorter exposure time the mode of action of this one is by oxidation dehydration or it alters the protein structure of the contaminating microorganism dry heat on its part can be applied by any of these following methods a by flaming flaming involves passing for instance a slide through a burning flame for two to three times which is expected to eliminate any viable microorganism on such a slide uh, the b part of uh, how the dry heat will be ap applied is heating until the material becomes red hot and this for instance when you want to sterilize your uh, your wire loop the wire loop is uh, let into uh, Bunsen burner flame until it turns red hot you let cool before you use in your inoculation another method of the dry heat application is incineration incineration generally is used on materials that are not wanted to be used again so it destroy any unwanted material in other words, you burn them outrightly since you are not going to have any use of it. So this is done into a, an incinerator. You carry those things that you don't want, that you expect that they will contaminate the environment and they are containing uh, contaminating microorganisms and let them into an incinerator and burn them. This keeps our environment safe and at the same time uh, destroy the contaminating microorganism that would have caused diseases to the environment and humans on a general note. The last of the dry heat application is hot air. This is applicable in ovens where, uh, as we said earlier, the temperature is higher and uh, the exposure time is also increased. The higher the temperature, the lower the exposure time. This is used in sterilization of heat labile materials. Now the second uh, physical agent in the control of microorganism is the cold temperatures, use of cold temperatures. Cold temperatures does not necessarily kill but we slow down the growth of microorganisms. In other words, they don't sterilize. They will make the materials to be static, the contaminating organism to be static. It doesn't kill. Such agents are microbiostatic. That is what I'm saying on a general note for microorganisms. It is applied at temperatures of minus 20 to 15 degrees Celsius. That is when you fridge it, you freeze it or you put it in a refrigerator. It is used in the preservation of food, media and cultures. Number three of the dry heat application is desiccation. This has to do with the gradual removal of water from cells. And this leads to metabolic inhibition. You know, without water, no metabolic activity is expected to take place. So in desiccation, water is removed from the cells of the contaminating organism and the metabolic activity of those cells comes to a standstill. That is why discussion is a process of storage, it's a process of preservation. It is not actually an effective microbial control 
uh, device sense. Many cells under such conditions will retain viability to grow when the water that was I've been issue removed is reintroduced. Lyophilization is an example of how this uh, desiccation occurs. It's an example of desiccation in which water removal process typically used to preserve perishable uh, materials and this extends its shelf life or make the material more convenient for transport. You remove the water from such a material such that growth will be suspended and uh, it can be easily easy for you. It can be easy for you then to transport such material from one place to the other since they will not overgrow and uh, they will be kept in that manner until water is restored. It is otherwise called freeze drying. You are freezing it and you are drying it at the same time. It is often used for long-term storage of materials. And as I said earlier, it is a preservation process. Number four of the physical methods of uh, controlling microorganisms is the use of osmotic pressure. It is the minimum pressure that must be applied to a solution to hurt the flow of solvent molecules from a semi-permeable membrane in a process we call osmosis. Now osmosis is the net flow of solvent from a solution of lower concentration of solute to the one with the higher concentration through a semi-permeable membrane. The, this osmotic effect is dependent on the concentration of solute which could either be salt or sugar particles present in the solution. For instance, when an environment outside a cell is hypertonic, that is having a higher tonicity than the contents of the cell itself, water will move from inside the cell to the outside environment by an osmotic uh, process causing a condition in the cell referred to as plasmolysis. Now this plasmolysis has to do with the contraction or shrinkage of the protoplasm as a result of the loss of water in the cell. The protoplasm has to do with the cytoplasm and the nucleus of the contaminating organism. So the, this will shrink, it will contract since there is no water there. You know, the water will bring it to shape, the water will get it engorged. And so when it is removed from there, the whole thing collapsed. And uh, this results in the death of the cell on a longer uh, date. It is used in food preservation, but less effective against fungi. High sugar uh, content used in candies, jerrys, and canned fruits. It also uses the principle of preserving such foods by this osmotic pressure. The high osmolarity is generally bacteriostatic. I said it, it doesn't kill, it only suspends the growth. Bacteria, however, are resistant to hypotonic environments due to the cell walls. You know, in the osmosis, we say that when the cell is in a hypertonic environment, the water will move from inside the cell to the outside environment that is having more or higher tonicity. Now, in an environment where the outside is having lower uh, is hypotonic, it's having lower tonicity. You know, generally, water is supposed to have now moved by this same osmosis to the inside of the cell, which in this case now have a higher uh, tonicity. But because bacteria, in this case, have cell wall, it survives such environments because the cell walls prevent this easy flow 
of uh, this water from the outside which is having lower tonicity to the inside of the cell which eventually would have burst the cell because of the increased volume therein. So bacteria survive such uh, environment courtesy of the cell walls they possess. Number five, radiation as one of the processes used or methods used in the control of microorganisms. Radiation has to do with the energy that comes from a source and travels through a space at a speed that is equivalent to that of light. And because waves are involved, the, they can be called electromagnetic uh, waves. Two types of radiation are used the ionizing radiation and the non-ionizing radiation. Under ionizing radiation, it makes use of short wavelength which has high intensity radiation to destroy the microorganisms contaminating a material. This it does by oxidizing the cellular components of the microbe contaminating the material in question it is used for sterilization of medical supplies. Like <coughs> example of such uh, ionizing radiation involves gamma rays and X-rays. The non-ionizing radiation uses longer wavelength and lower uh, energy. It means the penetration power or the intensity is lower in this case compared to the gamma rays or the x-rays this will act by forming a pyrimidine dimer in the dna strands which causes the replicative error and eventually the microbes dies the contaminating microorganism will die as a result of the effect of this non-ionizing radiation and examples of such uh, non-ionizing uh, radiation includes use of ultraviolet rays and use of infrared light. Uh, maybe you will get to a hospital and uh, you will see some people, they will use something like torch, but the light is red in color. See them applying to one's bare skin, heating intermittently and uh, you will be wondering what it is. That is what we call infrared light. They are trying to heat there. In fact, as they heat, blood comes there. As they heat, the organisms, if present on the skin there, are also taken care of. And so that is how the non-ionizing uh, radiation is also used. Number six is filtration one of the physical processes used in controlling microorganism filtration is technically defined as the process of separation suspending solid matter from a liquid by causing the latter which is the liquid to pass through the pores of a membrane called a filter that is what filtration is you allow a liquid to pass through a pore of a membrane that pore that membrane having those pores is called a filter so when you sieve through it you are doing the process filtration now based on the type of contaminant whether it is large or small filters of different pore sizes can be used examples of such is the HEPA filters which uh, removes microbes of sizes more than 0 0.3 micrometer. Another of the type of uh, filters used are the membrane filters which removes microbes of sizes uh, 0 0.22 micrometer. It is used to sterilize heat sensitive liquids and air in hospital isolation units and industrial clean rooms. If you want to sterilize uh, some rooms in a hospital, maybe having uh, 
patients, for instance, in a hospital setting that has diseases that are airborne, from time to time the rooms are sterilized using uh, this type of uh, uh, high energy filters. Now, we are done with the physical processes, chemical agents. Chemical agents can function, as said earlier, as disinfectants, antiseptics, and sterilants. We've already explained what disinfectants and antiseptics are. And so, we'll go ahead to see the factors that affect the germicidal activity. As we also said, of the factors that uh, affect those physical agents. Even the germicidal effect of the chemicals also have factors that influence their activity. Now the nature of the material being treated, the degree of contamination, the time of exposure of the chemical agent to the contaminating material, and lastly the strength and chemical action of the germicide. All these four points at one point or the other, depending to on the material being considered, affects the activity of these chemical agents. On a general note, the mode of action of the chemical agent has to do with any of these four uh, steps, depending on the type. It, it interferes with the enzymatic system of the organism. Number two, it coagulates the proteins of the contaminating organism. Three, it disrupts the cell membrane. And four, the, there is oxidative damage to the contaminating microbe. Now, chemical agents are generally classified into any of the following uh, groups or categories. One, alcohols. Alcohol act as surfactants, dissolving membrane lipids and coagulating proteins of vegetative bacteria cells and fungi. You know, assuming you have uh, in the house oily things like that and you carry, carry uh, maybe your alcohol or whatever and apply there you will see that they will remove the oil that is there we are trying to talk about how the surfactant effect dissolves such lipid membrane even on the organism it's just an example, a typical example of how alcohols are used. Maybe your germicidal action of this alcohol increases with increase in molecular weight of the alcohol in use. Example of the alcohols commonly used is ethanol, used for controlling microorganisms and for practical purposes, 70% uh, ethanol is used and the principle that it operates is act by denaturing the cellular uh, proteins act by denaturing the cellular proteins it is also a dehydrating agent as we talk of plasmolysis in the other one it removes water from cells and uh, that causes the cell to eventually get plasmolized and die. The uses of alcohol. Alcohol is effective in reducing the microbial flora on skin, and that is the essence why you will see it being used in hand sanitizers. You know, we've just passed the uh, era that we have this uh, COVID-19 and the hand sanitizers, you remember, was one of the key things that was used as a control measure. Continuous wash of hands and use of hand sanitizers. 
all the hand sanitizers were made to contain alcohol and the alcohol the action there is to reduce the microbial flora on our skin so that is the use of the alcohols as a chemical in the control of microorganisms for disinfecting oral thermometers as one of the uses of alcohol in a hospital setup if they want to take your oral temperature the oral temperature specifically meant for this place and maybe until now they are used from one patient to the other so to disinfect to remove certain uh, contaminating microorganisms they are wiped with alcohol swabs in between patients so that to reduce the organisms being transferred from one patient to the other. Now in conjunction with iodine, alcohol is also used to prepare skin for surgery or injections. They want to decontaminate your skin. Alcohol alongside with iodine is used to scrub the surface of the skin before they will open you up. Or if you want to take an injection in the hospital, you will see them swabbing the skin with a swab. That a swab. That swab, what it contains is alcohol. The whole essence is just to reduce the microbial flora on the skin. Alcohol is used also as a disinfectant to clinical instruments and surgical instruments. They are soaked inside alcohol in order to disinfect those instruments at concentrations above 60 degrees Celsius it is effective even in killing viruses number two of the chemical agents used in the control of uh, microorganisms is phenol and phenolic compounds phenol otherwise called carbolic acid is an acrid it's a poisonous compound derived from the distillation of quota it has a wide spectrum of antimicrobial activity wide in the sense that it has the ability to, to act even on gram positive and gram negative organisms usually 2 to 5 percent acquired solution of phenol is used as a disinfectant. Now the phenol has limited application because it is absorbed by the skin and mucous membrane and causes toxicity to the skin. So its use is limited. Now some of the derivatives of phenol compounds and the application include the use of methylphenol otherwise called chrysol. It is used in Lysol. You know, Lysol is a disinfectant. We know that. In solution form, used to sterilize glassware and to mop uh, the floor in hospital places or even in your house if you care. You use Lysol to mop the floor. The chemical dairy is methylphenol. We also make use of uh, Dito even in our houses, even in the hospital. That the chemical there is dimethylphenol. It is active and is commonly used as an antiseptic uh, for even our bath, wa bathing water, where uh, the toe is just dropped a little inside and uh, you make use of the water. Just as I said, maybe in washing the floors and things like that. Habitane is another of the phenol compounds used. It is a component of savlon. You know, these terms I'm using, whether savlon or detour or lysol, are chemical uh, antiseptics or disinfectants that we know that we use some in the house. Yeah, like the salvon we are trying to mention now, 
is used on uh, as an antiseptic on burns, on wounds, on preoperative antisepsis of skin. If you have a wound, you go to the hospital and they want to dress the wound. You will see them uh, dropping a chemical on top. That chemical is savlon. They are trying to clean and remove contaminating microorganisms, either in such burns or in such wounds or in such uh, preoperative antisepsis of the skin. This one, before the operation, they will try to swab the skin to prevent uh, sepsis. Now, hexachlorophane is one of the phenol compounds also used. Uh, differently, it is insoluble in water and therefore is used in our soaps. It's one of the component of soaps. Your antiseptic soaps and uh, all those things contain one of these chemicals as a disinfectant or antiseptics in this case, sorry. Now, chlorhexidine is one of the commonly used phenol compounds and has very ranging applications which span through hand scrubbing, preparing skin sites for surgery or injections, or used in neonatal wash, or used as a wound cleanser, or as a preservative for eye solutions. It acts by killing microorganisms by a variety of effects, such as disruption of the cells, precipitation of cellular protein, inactivation of enzymes, and then leakage of cellular material. Another of the chemicals used, chemical agents used in the control of microorganisms is halogen compounds. Halogens are non-metallic elements that are commonly found in minerals, sea waters, and salt. Examples of such uh, halogen compounds include iodine, chlorine, fluorine, and bromine. If you remember your electrochemical series, these are non-metallic uh, elements found in one class in your electrochemical series. They are used as chemical agents in the control of microorganisms. Iodine, number one of it, is used in many forms, whether in the aqueous solution or as a tincture of iodine, or is used as iodophore. The aqueous uh, iodine and the tincture of iodine have some side effects, such as staining and irritation. Therefore, nowadays, iodine Idofor rather is used as a replacement of the aqueous and the tincture of iodine since this latter have less side effects. The mode of action of this iodine, it is a powerful oxidizing agent and therefore irreversibly oxidizes the cellular materials of the contaminating microbe. Iodine also brings halogenation of tyrosine residue of protein and enzymes and inactivate them. It diffuses through the membrane of cells where it denatures proteins and interfere with hydrogen and disulfide bonds, you know, that holds those cells together. And eventually, the cell will give way. The uses of iodine is used as an effective uh, agent against all kinds of uh, bacteria. It even possesses sporicidal effect. So if it even forms spores, spores uh, iodine has the capacity to uh, attack such contaminating microorganism. Iodine is highly fungicidal and to some extent even vericidal. It attacks fungi, it attacks viruses killing contaminating uh, 
these contaminating uh, organisms in the material being considered for disinfection or even in this case now sterilization either four are widely used for antisepsis of skin mucous membrane and wound IOD preparation can also be used for other purposes such as disinfection of water air and sanitization of food utensils you know if you go to a water plant and they tell you they cannot pump water because they don't have uh, this and that the iod is a component alongside with chlorine when we reach there that they use in uh, putting into water before they will not pump it out for community or public consumption it is used as a topical antiseptic before surgery and occasionally as a treatment for burned and infected skin chlorine now chlorine in the form such as hypochlorite and chloramine is used as disinfectant free gaseous chlorine is difficult to handle as it it is corrosive and it is toxic now calcium hypochlorite or sodium hypochlorite are commonly used the aqueous solution of sodium hypochlorite at 5.25 percent is called household bleach chloramine is more stable than hypochlorite so it is more effective germicidal than the hypochlorite in other words uh, the chloramine is more stable and so its use is more than the hypochlorite that is the bleach uh, household bleach we are trying to talk about now the uses of chlorine now Chlorine is one of the commonly used water disinfectant, as said earlier. I was talking about IOD. See that uh, together with the chlorine, they will drop in water to decontaminate it before they pump it out for public uh, consumption. Calcium hypochlorite is used as sanitizer for cooking utensils. 1% bleach is used for personal hygiene. You drop that in your bathing water. Higher concentrations of this uh, chlorine at 5 to 12 percent is used in swimming pools and household uh, and for household purposes. In swimming pool, you will see them dropping uh, the chlorine at 5 to 12 percent just to disinfect or decontaminate the swimming pool to avoid uh, transfer of uh, infections since people bath there from time to time or swims there from time to time. Chlorine is also used in the food industry. It is also used to disinfect open wounds, to treat athlete foods, which is a fungal infection, and other infections as a general antiseptic. It is generally effective on bacteria, endospores, fungi, and viruses. In other words, chloroquine is effective on most, if not all, the classes of uh, microorganisms. Yet, it has drawbacks. One of the drawbacks is that it is effective if used at an alkaline pH. Another of the drawback it has is if there is excess organic matter, this reduces its activity and are relatively unstable, especially if you see it exposed to light. That is why in most of these cases you see them being stored in uh, dark brown content, I mean bottles, and away from direct sunlight. The mode of action. When hypochlorite or chloramine is added in water, free chlorine is released in the form of a hypochlorous acid, HClO. Now the hypochlorous acid so released decomposes 
to release nascent oxygen and it's a powerful oxidizing agent and this kills microorganism by oxidizing the cellular components of the contaminating organism. Chloroquine and chlorine compounds also inactivate the proteins and enzymes by direct chlorination. Once you add chlorine there, it, it inactivates the protein of the, and then the enzymes of the contaminating organism such that their metabolic activities are impaired. Number three of the halogens we are talking about is a fluorine. Fluorine, like chlorine, in its ionic state is highly toxic to humans. Now, compounds containing sodium fluoride are used as microbiocidal agents. But when you use it in its ionic state, it's very toxic. So it is now used alongside sodium as a compound now, and it has a, a microbiocidal effect. They are commonly found in mud rinses and toothpastes. You see your toothpaste there, you will see that uh, fluorine is a component of it. The, its effect there is to serve as an antiseptic for any contaminating uh, microbes in your buccal cavity. Number four of the chemical uh, agents used in control of microorganism is uh, heavy metals and their compounds and uh, most of the heavy metals have the antimicrobial action examples of such uh, heavy metals include mercury silver and copper the mode of action of these uh, heavy metals and their compounds is that they combine directly with cellular proteins and enzymes and in inactivate them so once they are inactivated, metabolism is affected. High concentration of heavy metal salts also coagulates and precipitates the cellular proteins and key the microorganisms. So some of the commonly used metal compounds include mercuric chloride, which is used as ointment and as antiseptics. Number two of these uh, heavy metal compounds include silver nitrate. It has bacteriostatic effect as well as uh, bactericida. Uh, it can slow down and it can also kill microorganisms when applied to a material in question. It is used in eye drops to prevent optamia neonatron in children. If you see some children are born with pussy eyes, pus coming out from the eye. That disease condition is called optamia neonatron. So when they are born as such, silver nitrate is dropped into their eyes so that they can either serve as bacteriostatic or bactericida, preventing the contaminating organism from continuously releasing uh, the pus in such children's eye. Number three, as an example of the heavy metal compounds, is copper sulfate. It is widely used against algae and mold in swimming pools. So it's one of the things that uh, is used also in swimming pools to decontaminate it. Another point or one of the methods of chemical agents used in control of microorganism is the use of aldehydes. Examples include formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde, which are the commonly used one. Both of them have uh, microbiocida, including sporicida effect on contaminating microorganisms. 
Now, for Madehide, as one of the other heights, it is stable only in higher concentrations and in higher temperatures. At room temperature, it polymerizes to form paradehyde, paraformadehyde. Formadehyde is used in two forms, in that gaseous form or in an aqueous uh, solution at 40% uh, level, which we call formalin. The uses of uh, formaldehyde include the vapor from it, either from formalin or paraformaldehyde, is used for disinfection and sterilization of closed rooms such as operating theater. Uh, remember earlier we said that if you have patients that are having diseases that are prone to be airborne, from time to time such rooms are sterilize using vapor and uh, this uh, air that we're talking about now will be made sterile since all microorganisms present there will be killed when such vapor uh, is let in since they have uh, microbiocidal effect. Formaldehyde vapor is also used to disinfect uh, woolen uh, blanket wools and footwears of fungal infected persons and then lastly formalin by a lecture is used for preservation of biological specimens if they want to do a biopsy on a, a patient the cut tissue is let into a solution to be kept there in that form over time that biological uh, sorry that uh, solution into which the tissue, the cut tissue is let in, is formalin, that 40% uh, solution of formaldehyde. It will be let there, which will preserve and prevent the tissue from decaying. Formaldehyde is therefore used for embalmment of uh, dead tissues, which will keep it and preserve the body in that manner over time. Number two of the examples of aldehyde is glutaraldehyde. It is used at 2% solution and like formaldehyde, it is effective against bacteria, fungi, spores and viruses. Glutaraldehyde is used to sterilize urological instruments and respiratory therapy instruments want to sterilize things uh, using respiratory therapy, whether they are forceps, they are uh, scissors, they are whatever, they are let into a 2% solution of uh, glutaraldehyde, which we sterilize them before use. Number six of the chemical agents used in uh, the control of microbes is the gaseous agents. Examples of such gaseous agents include ethylene oxides, beta propiolactone, and formaldehyde. That example of formaldehyde under the heights is also used. We remember we say it's used also in the gaseous form. So when you are talking of gaseous agents generally, formaldehyde also has a part. To play here since it can be used as a solution at 40 percent uh, level or in the gaseous form and they are used as sterilizing agents ethylene oxide in its gaseous form is used at above 10.8 degrees celsius ethylene oxide have high antimicrobial activity since it kills even endospores. It is used for sterilization of heat sensitive materials such as spices, oils, and plastics. If you, for instance, carry a plastic material and you want to sterilize it and you let it into hot air oven, 
that uses high temperature uh, for sterilization because it is heat sensitive you know that it will be destroyed so such materials now are sterilized by use of uh, a clean oxide you don't expose them to that uh, kind of heat you use this chemical and uh, disinfect your plastic materials a clean oxide is used in formulation with uh, carbon dioxide and uh, that compound is called freon number two of the gaseous uh, agents used is bitter propylactone it's a gas above 15.5 degrees Celsius once the temperature reaches that it turns gaseous the penetrating power of this chemical is less than a clean oxide but it is more active in killing microorganisms even though it doesn't penetrate uh, as a clean oxide due to its carcinogenic effect it is not commonly used in other words it has the tendency and capacity to cause cancer and so for its usage is uh, not uh, common number seven which will be a, one of the examples or methods of uh, chem use of chemical agents in the control of uh, microorganisms is detergents detergents are used primarily for cleaning purposes but it has also antimicrobial properties you know, detergent is the general name but uh, we often call it homo these are trademark names call it uh, uh, area call it this and that these ones are trademark names the modern name uh, they are generally called uh, detergents three types are recognized the cationic detergents, anionic detergents, and the non-anionic detergents. Cationic detergents is more significant germicidal agent than the other two. That is the anionic and the non-anionic. For example, the quaternary ammonium compounds is a cationic detergent having germicidal action. It is more effective against gram-positive bacteria. You know, it's a common uh, chemical agent used in, uh, as a germicide. And it is said here that it is um, a cationic detergent. And its use is more than the non-anionic uh, and even the anionic uh, detergent. Now, detergents are used as disinfectant, sanitizers, and antiseptics. They are also used to disinfect hospital floor when you are mopping it. They have the uh, antiseptic uh, effect. So you will wash the floor. As you are washing, you are removing contaminating microbes. The mode of action, <clears throat> one, detergents are keyed I mean, detergents kill microorganisms by nurturing their proteins and enzymes, thereby interfering with their uh, glycolysis. You know, glycolysis is the breakdown of uh, carbohydrates into the building block, the simple sugars. So it, it affairs with it. And you know what that means. The energy the microorganism need comes from the glycolysis process, which releases the ATP that is used at the end of it all. So when the detergents kills these organisms by that process of interfering with uh, the glycolysis process, the organism eventually dies. Detergents also damages cell wall and cell membrane. And you know, it's essential that these uh, two.
two cell surfaces or cell components are present for the nucleic acid to be sustained. If there is no cell membrane, the nucleic acid on its own cannot stand. That is why even the virus that has just a common nucleic acid still have capsid to protect the inner uh, genome of the virus. So if you have anything that will destroy the cell membrane and the cell wall, the cell is as good as dead. The last of the use of uh, chemical agents is the use of antibiotics. Antibiotics are secondary metabolites produced by certain microorganisms which inhibits the growth of other microorganisms. Different groups of antibiotics have different mode of actions. In other words, depending on the type of uh, antibiotic you are going to use, the mode of action and therefore the target of the antibiotic all differs. So depending on the suspecting, contaminating or affecting uh, microorganism, the type of antibiotic to be used differs. So that is what forms the basis of, no, don't use this one, use this one. Or no, don't use this one, use this type of antibiotic. So different groups of antibiotics have different mode of actions and have different type of organisms that they attack. So the mode of action <coughs> runs through any of these, depending on the type of uh, antibiotic one is using. Some of the antibiotics used inhibit cell wall peptidoglycan synthesis. And you know peptidoglycan is the chief component of cell walls. I've just explained the need and the use and the necessity of the cells with cell wall, what it helps the cells to survive. You know, with, when we're talking about uh, cells in hypotonic uh, environment, is the same cell wall that prevents uh, the bacteria from bursting. If not ordinarily, in a hypotonic environment, the water will flow from the outside to the inside of the cell and because it will continuously get entry, the cell will eventually burst. But because of the peptidoglycan that is a chief component of the cell wall, the bacteria survives even in such environments. So the antibiotics, some of them, will inhibit the production of this uh, cellular component and such cells without cell wall will not be able to withstand the pressure coming from the drug and it will eventually die. So such drugs that does uh, attacks the cell wall includes penicillin and a class of antibiotics called cephalosporins. Number two of the mode of action of antibiotics has to do with them inhibiting cell membrane biosynthesis. You are also aware of the use of cell membrane in cells, a semi-permeable membrane through which materials move in and out of the cell, depending on the type of uh, material. Now, such drugs that attack the cell membrane uh, biosynthesis includes such antibiotics like polymycin and a class of drugs generally called polyms. Number three of the mode of action of antibiotics include the ability to inhibit protein synthesis. You are aware, we've said earlier, of the use of protein in living cells. It's a component of most cellular structures and you know without it life is not there because certain enzymes which themselves are also protein will not function and so such drugs that inhibit protein synthesis include tetracyclines chloramphenicol 
and a host of others. So such antibiotics will inhibit the synthesis of protein. So such anti uh, microorganisms will not survive. The number five of the mode of action of antibiotics has to do with the ability to react with nucleic acids. The nucleic acid, the RNAs, the DNAs, which is the genome that transmits uh, characteristics from parents to offsprings that keep life going. The rifampicin, as an example of one of the antibiotics, and quinolones generally attacks the nucleic acid and this kills the cells. The last of the listed mode of action of antibiotics here has to do with the ability to inhibit folic acid synthesis. And such drugs that does such uh, activity or uh, mode of action is uh, sulfonamides and uh, trimetoprene. Your septrin is a common example of a class of drugs that function by inhibiting folic acid synthesis. And you know what folic acid is in the body. It's a very essential uh, cofactor in enzyme synthesis and even in uh, other functions like vitamins and whatever. So, uh, on a general note, we've considered the st sterilization and uh, disinfection and use of chemotherapeutic agents in the control of microorganisms where we've spoken about the physical application and we're now ending with the chemical agents as used in the control of microorganisms. And uh, quickly, you will recall that we've spoken about the use of heat as one of the physical agent, and the heat could be physical, I mean, it could be dry heat or moist heat. We've also spoken about the use of other means in the physical way, whether by radiation or by filtration or things like that, in the physical angle to control the spread or contamination or spoilage by microorganisms. Now, under chemical, we've spoken about the use of alcohols, use of aldehydes, use of halogens, use of phenol and phenol compounds, phenolic compounds, use of heavy metals, use of antibiotics, use of detergents, and you will understand that when any of this is used, a number of uh, factors affect their use, and what we inform their use also is dependent on their mode of action, the material in question, and the status of the contaminating microorganisms. So once you have this basis, you know what to use at a particular point in time to effect either sterilization, if it is bactericida, or generally microbiocida, or you just want to inhibit the growth of microorganisms in the processing uh, material, such microbiostatic agents. Thanks for listening.